Hey there. Hello, and good to see everybody who is with me again on this Bible study opportunity this week. I'm very excited to be with you, and I'm looking forward to a great set of Bible studies this week on the life of Jesus in his final week. You know, last week we talked some about um, Jesus' first sermon. And so there was three chapters worth of good content about that. I don't know if I've got my microphone turned on or not. Oh well, we'll just keep going like it's normal. Anyway, so we talked about Jesus' sermon last week, the Sermon on the Mount, and there was some really powerful teaching there. And it really made me want to explore some more in the life of Jesus. And so because of that, I uh, have decided to talk about Jesus' final week. I've been wanting to do some chronological Bible studies for some time now, and I felt that it would be good this week to continue my own chronological studies and to invite you to join me as we learn about Jesus' final week. Now, I hope everybody's taking notes and uh, that you're going to follow along with me. Give me just a second to adjust my YouTube camera. It's not showing everything, and I'd hate for people to miss out on the whiteboard video. So, um, this week's series is called Jesus' Final Week, and today we're going to be talking about a triumphal entry, and it's going to be about Jesus' um, Sunday and Monday before his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, if you're taking notes, I'd like for you to write down this main idea because I want all of us together um, to be thinking about what we can take away from this. And here's the main idea that I want you to take away. I can see what happened on Sunday and Monday before Jesus died and resurrected. That's pretty simple. Um, but it's important for us to appreciate just the timeline of the things that happen. I mean, we're talking about a super big chunk of the Gospels, right? And uh, I can't give you a percentage off the, the top of my head, but I would say it's probably somewhere in the 25 or more of the Gospels are related specifically to this last week. And we've gone through Jesus' years of ministry, and here we are at his final week. So I want you to be thinking about that. What, what's happening that Sunday and Monday before his death and resurrection? Write down these questions. Why did the donkey matter? I don't know yet. Why did the donkey matter? Did Jesus get hangry? Sometimes I get hangry. But did Jesus get hangry? And finally, was this the only temple cleansing? Uh, the one that we're going to talk about today. Now, uh, as you get those written down and you get your notes ready to go, I just want to... Uh, offer these three announcements for you. And uh, that is, first, please use a private message if you would like to ask me a question or make a comment about the video. I really don't uh, plan on interacting with the comment section on these live stream studies. Um, so the best way to reach me is through a private message, please. Number two, uh, I want to do my part to help foster some unity and uh, just show what's available in our brotherhood. We have a lot of very talented people. And so I want you to write down the website christianrepository.com, christianrepository.com. And uh, Christian Repository is a website that Brother Matthew Barnes operates. And man, it's got some great stuff because it's really just meant to be a collection of all of the brotherhood's resources. One of the things that I use Christian Repository for is uh, Brother Matt has all of Johnny Elmore's Bible study questions. So just chapter by book by book, chapter by chapter, even verse by verse, a question for each one. So it helps me as a study leader uh, organize my Bible studies so that as I interact with people, I've kind of got questions pre-written out for me. So that's that was very good. And then finally, I want you to help me beat the algorithms. I've said it in weeks past, and I'm saying it again. Please help me beat the algorithms. The more that people like the content, then uh, the, the channels that I'm offering this content on, the higher up I get to be in a Google search or whenever you're just in the search bar of YouTube or Facebook. So not just the video, but the channel itself or the, the page itself. Please like, subscribe, and follow, and that will be helpful for me whenever other people are looking for it. So in a small way, you're doing your part to help 
evangelize to the lost. Okay, so that's our questions and our content for uh, opening. Here's today's layout for our Bible study. And uh, you'll see that there's going to be three main sections. We're talking about Sunday, the triumphal entry, and then Monday and Monday. We've got two things going on on Monday, the fig tree curse and the temple cleanse. So uh, you can write down those how you want to. I'm going to be filling in these nine sections. And so if you want to have it all going right now, please go ahead and do so. But if you would like to just kind of stay with me here at the beginning, that way you're organized. I think that's a good idea too. So you do what works best for you. You do you, okay? You do you. Now, uh, Jesus' triumphal entry. Uh, let's talk about some context leading up to this first of many great narratives in the final week of Jesus' life. Uh, it's important for us to, to think about where Jesus is coming from. And in Luke chapter 19, verse 1, if you want to write that down, Luke chapter 19, verse 1, Jesus is passing through Jericho. And that should tell us some pretty uh, pivotal pieces of information. Just yesterday, I preached a sermon about the Psalms of Ascent that I totally pirated from Brother Kevin Fox. And Kevin's got a YouTube channel you can just look up Kevin Fox Psalms of Ascent where he talks about the Psalms of Ascent. And the, the concept was that these Psalms, which I believe is Psalm 120 through 134. Um, by the way, my fan is on up there and it is killing me with coldness. So let me kind of squeeze back here real quick and turn my fan off. I'll be right back. Give me 20 seconds. I'm still here. I'm just really cold. And that fan is doing nothing for me. I don't know why I put it on in the first place. So let me make sure my sound panels don't fall on me like they did last week after I was done recording. Okay, here I can. Here I'm coming back. Anyway, uh, Psalm chapter 120 through 134, the Psalms of Ascent, when the Israelites of old would be climbing from Jericho up this 17-mile this hike from Jericho up to Jerusalem. They're going to be ascending over 3,000 feet from 850 below sea level to somewhere around 2,300 above sea level. And they would sing the whole time. And they would sing these songs or psalms of ascent. And so, you know, imagine hiking uphill and you're singing all the way. Well, you need to go check out what Kevin Fox has because it's some really good information. But here we see Jesus starting in that same traditional trek, 17 miles from Jerusalem in Luke chapter 19. And he begins the ascent uh, up to Jerusalem. And it really is a time of singing and triumph. Now, in addition to where he was um, as he was going, we should talk about what's going on right here. It's Passover week. And so Jesus is not alone in going up to Jerusalem. In fact, there's many pilgrims from the, the Judean area, the, the outer area, even as far as, as Jews might be willing to travel and proselytes. I mean, they're coming even from places like Ethiopia, right? So we know that there's just a, a ton of people coming in for these celebrations of the Passover and Pentecost. And so it's a very special time. It's a very electric time. It's alive. And it's at this time that Jesus starts his ascent from Jericho up to Jerusalem. And another thing uh, as we begin is I want you to write down this scripture. It's Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And we'll come back to it in a moment as we briefly talk about the story. Um, but I want you to write down Zechariah 9, verse 9, because it'll help us with the context of putting this in place with what happened in the Old Testament. Okay, here's the scriptures for the narrative. And I will do my best to both tell you the narrative, for those who may be unfamiliar with it, and write these scriptures down at the same time. Now, typically for me, that's a very dangerous combination, but hopefully I can make it. Jesus uh, was ascending to Jerusalem, and so he had some of his followers go and find a donkey. And so they find this donkey that had never been ridden, and uh, they throw their coats over it, and Jesus starts the ascent, and he gets up to the gates of Jerusalem, riding on the colt of a donkey. And as he uh, gets there, or on a young donkey, and as he gets there, 
um, people are stripping the palm leaves off of branches of palm trees, which, by the way, I hope somebody out there saw that reference in my little uh, advertisement that I put on Facebook and Instagram on the final week. It was a palm leaf and an empty tomb, and that was to show the beginning and the end of this final week experience. So there's your artistic uh, moment for the day. But they're pulling off palm trees and they're laying them on the road and they're shaking them in the air, kind of like pom-poms. And then they're taking off their coats and they're laying them on the road. And, and as Jesus is passing, they're saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Hosanna simply is a phrase that meant, Oh, save! You see, it's a time of great excitement, and Jesus riding on this donkey coming up to Jerusalem is not casual. It means something very important, very significant, because in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Look, behold, your king is coming, sitting on the, the, the foal of a donkey, or on a, on a young donkey, and the idea there is that Jesus is coming as the king. And all of these people are excited because finally the king is coming. Now, the frustrating part is twofold. First, most of them think that he's coming as a military king and that he's symbolically riding in to show that the king is coming and, and soon he's going to wipe the Romans out of there and they're going to get to be free again and not have a foreign power uh, overseeing them. Well, we know that that's simply not true. Uh, we'll talk about that in the takeaways in just a moment. The other frustrating thing about that, and it's really tragic, is that this same mob of people, this mob of Jerusalem that's shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David, are going to be the ones who are calling for his crucifixion and his death in about five more days. Now, that's just tragic to think, to think about that. Now, in the moment, as Jesus is riding this uh, donkey up, there are those who are uh, excited and they're, they're, they're just really on fire about their Messiah, their, their king being there. And then there's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There are the religious leaders. In verse 39 and 40 of uh, Luke chapter 19, some of them begin to say to Jesus, do you not hear the things that these people are saying about you or these things are saying to you? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, if these people kept silent, the rocks would cry out. To me, that's always just been one of the coolest scriptures, one of the coolest responses that you could have. I'm never the type of person that can come up with the best response in the moment. Um, I always think about it, you know, hours later, I'm in the shower or I'm in bed and I go, oh, you know, I should have said that. But Jesus is able to say just very coolly, calmly and truthfully that this moment is so special that if nobody was there to praise it, that the rocks would be screaming out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Thankfully, there were those who were waving their palm branches and throwing their coats on the road. And it really is this special scene, this triumphal entry of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Well, let's maybe mention a few takeaways and then we'll move on to the next scene. And I'd, I'd just like to say this. The important part of our Bible study today is the scriptures. Um, they stand alone, and the purpose of them being in the Bible is for us to hear and to see and understand the good news of Jesus. These takeaways, the application of, of the, the Bible text, the extrapolation, whatever you might want to call it, these takeaways are secondary. When you read through the scriptures, primarily you should be encountering Jesus in his final week. These are just really good things to, to glean that are extra, some that I've come up with, some that others have come up with. I'll tell you right now. I'm standing on the shoulders of greater men. And uh, so my, uh, some people that I really love and respect have shared some notes with me in, in kind of leading up to this uh, series of studies for the week. And so I'm thankful for them and grateful that I can glean some of their information. So write these down, please. One takeaway that we get from the triumphal entry is the faithfulness of God. And that's directly related to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Aren't you thankful that God ordained so many things before it really happened and we have evidence of it in prophecy? Prophecy is one of the strongest evidences for me to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. 
Now, the, the strongest piece of evidence is the empty tomb and the, the way that uh, history works around that. But right there next to it is prophecy. And so God is faithful. And that's a great takeaway that I get uh, from this biblical account. Here's another takeaway that I get, and that is the compassion, the compassion of heaven. In Luke's account of this narrative, Jesus, after this triumphal entry, uh, he then has this time of weeping where he is weeping and mourning over Jerusalem because he knows what's going to happen. He knows that this moment of triumph and joy is, is short-lived. And I'll just tell you this as well. This isn't the first time that Jesus ex has experienced it. And I don't think it makes it any easier. But, you know, Jesus had a year of obscurity where he uh, kind of was working behind the scenes and, and laying the foundation. And then he had a year of popularity where his miracles become widely known and there's large crowds that follow him. And then his third year is the year of opposition. And in John chapter 6, where the year of opposition really starts to begin, most of his, of his followers leave him. And he turns to his devoted 12 and maybe some others who are around him and he says, will you not leave me as well? And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? We've come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of God. But even with this devoted band of followers, I, I'm, I'm sure it must be difficult to see so many turn and go away. And that's kind of the similar mindset that Jesus is going through right now, this, this compassionate mindset of seeing so many so excited, but then to know that ultimately the majority will reject him. And so he weeps and he laments for Jerusalem. And it's, I think, important for us to, to take that away that heaven weeps for the lost, that Jesus really does care whenever people turn away from him, that there's not just like this, eh, good riddance, but that he really takes it personally whenever people reject him. Okay, here's our final one, and then we will move on to the next, and that is that the king is here. And I want you to write down Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, because this scripture talks about how the kingdom of heaven is within us. It's within our hearts. And so when Jesus comes as a king into Jerusalem and, and they mistake that as, as a conquering hero, what they miss out on is that he was coming as a king. He was coming to die for our sins. And he's raising up a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom is here. We are that kingdom now. Okay, let's move into Monday. So after Jesus goes into Jerusalem, that triumphal entry, it's very symbolic. People needed to see it. He then leaves the city, and then he goes to rest, and he's going to come back in on Monday, the next day. And that's where we begin, is uh, this fig tree curse. Now, so that's some things about context that we want to, to write down real quick. So this first takes place on the way in, and then it ends up on his way out. So Jesus, on the way in, will curse the fig tree, he will go in and cleanse the temple, and then on his way out, they will see what happened to the fig tree. Uh, here's a point of context that we want to mention before we tell the story, and that was that Jesus was not hangry. Now, some people get hangry, and I am definitely one of them. So let that be known. Let the record show that Jonathan can get hangry. And that simply means, for those who may be not familiar with it, you get cranky whenever your blood sugar gets low and you start to maybe be a little bit more snippy than you normally are. And Jesus did not get hangry and thus curse the fig tree, but rather he's teaching a highly symbolic lesson. And real quick, you could write down Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, because we know that Jesus did not misuse his power. Otherwise, he would have turned those loaves into bread whenever the devil asked him to do such a thing. But this is a sad, symbolic gesture. This is a sad, symbolic gesture because the Jewish people at that time living in that place, specifically their religious leadership, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, the priests, the teachers of the law, the scribes, etc., uh, they completely rejected the Messiah. They rejected God's truth. And as a result of that, they would be completely rejected. They were like a fig tree who had a bunch of leaves and looked righteous. 
but they were not righteous because they weren't bearing any fruit for the kingdom of heaven. And so in the same way that Jesus curses this fig tree, sadly, those that reject him will also be cursed because they have abandoned truth. Now, the scriptures where this happens chronologically is Matthew chapter 21, verse 18 through 22, and then Mark chapter 11, verse 12 through 14. And simply put, Jesus is walking into Jerusalem. He sees this tree. It's got a bunch of leaves on it. It looks like it's going to be a great breakfast opportunity to get a few figs before he goes into uh, Jerusalem. And he starts looking through it, and there's nothing there. And he says, may you never bear fruit again. Now, after he goes in and then he comes back, they find that the fig tree has withered, and they're shocked. And Jesus then goes on to explain what one can do in faith. But uh, just a word quickly about um, this parable or this this episode with the fig tree. I just want to to for you to maybe think about this. This is the only miracle that is ever done to pronounce judgment. Every other miracle was done in compassion and love and mercy, and and the miracles were meant to testify and prove Jesus' power so that people could witness to what he was doing and and how he was helping others. But the, the miracle of the fig tree, the miraculous cursing, was a miracle of judgment. And it is highly unique, but it was also meant to illustrate the sad, symbolic fate of those who had rejected the Messiah. Now, here are some takeaways that we can get from the fig tree curse. All right, so the first one is that you need to practice what you preach. Just like those religious leaders, they said they were righteous. Uh, they, they kind of tooted their own horns as far as how righteous they were. But really, they didn't practice what they preached. And Jesus will talk about them more uh, tomorrow on the Tuesday Bible study where he has this long day of preaching. And in Matthew 23 specifically, he will really kind of put their feet to the fire because they have not been practicing what they preached. So the second takeaway is that you and I need to bear fruit. And what I'd like to do, is, if you're taking notes, is I want to get you started on a bearing fruit or a spiritual fruit uh, Bible chain. You know, we did Bible chains a few weeks ago. Is that wild to think this is our fourth week of Bible studies together? I'm so thankful that uh, for those who have been able to watch a lot of these, and they've kind of come back week after week, and, and I get text messages about it, about how helpful they are. I'm thankful for you because it kind of motivates me to want to keep going. Um, that's kind of maybe for another day about my, my plans, how long I plan to do this. But it's been really good for the past few weeks, and uh, going all the way back to week one when we were doing Bible chains. Anyway... Um, I'm thinking about that right now. So here is a bearing fruit Bible chain. I want you to write down Matthew chapter 7, verse 17 through 19. You should be really familiar with that one because we talked about it last week with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, talking about those who bear fruit, or, or don't bear fruit, rather. You could write down Luke chapter 13, verse 6 through 9. You could write down John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Let's get some uh, ones that are not in the Gospels. Let's write down Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Let's write down Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. I think you can see all those. And there's so much more. There's many more. So you can go to, you know, Google, or uh, if you have eSword like me, and if you don't have eSword, Go to my YouTube channel. I have an eSword tutorial. You really need to get eSword, like for real. Go get eSword today. It's free to download. Most of the stuff on it's free. Please go get eSword. But you can just type in fruit, a word search in your Bible, and then you have to sift through it yourself. You're not going to be able to make the search engine uh, take out things that are not in context. But do a Bible chain on bearing fruit, and you'll be very rewarded by it. So as Jesus curses the fig tree, he then goes into the temple. We're still on Monday, right? So it's still Monday. He didn't get a breakfast at the fig tree. So he goes into the temple area. And this is where we have this famous scene of Jesus cleansing the temple. So what I'd like for you to do is uh, 
maybe write down a few pieces of context with me. Did you know that the temple complex was about 25 acres? It's huge, isn't it? 25 acres worth of temple. Now, you can go to Google and just do a Google image search for Herod's Temple Complex. Herod's Temple Complex. And this is what you'll find. You'll find a little rectangle that that's the temple area itself where they had their uh, holy and most holy place. And then there was the courtyard of the priests, and that's where the priests offered the sacrifices. I know it's kind of small, maybe on the whiteboard, but i got to save my space. Uh, then you had this court of the men, and so males could enter this area, and then uh, the court of the women. But this is all Jewish, right? And so there's a big W for women, and there's an M for men, and here's a T for temple. Now, outside of these courts, this biggest complex is a court of the Gentiles. So we'll do, here, I'll just write it right there, court of the Gentiles. And uh, this is the area where some of the bad things were happening that Jesus really needs to take care of. So what's going on here in this court of the Gentiles? Uh, we can see that there were merchants and money changers. Okay, and we know that from Mark chapter 11. So write that down. Mark chapter 11, verse 15 and 16. Now the merchants and money changers are cluttering up this temple area, which is supposed to be, as Jesus will say, a house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of thieves or a den of robbers. And the idea is that these money changers and merchants are kind of swindling travelers. That as people were coming in and they had to exchange uh, to, in order to get their, their um, sacrifice for the Passover, that they were getting fleeced a little bit, no pun intended, with the sheep. But they were getting fleeced financially by those who were changing money. That the merchants were taking this holy place, a place that was designed for prayer, and they were turning it into just a common market and all the sounds of a common market. But here's an additional one. I didn't even know about this, but uh, somebody in their notes had it written down, and um, so I wanted to share it with you. But there was a lot of shortcuts that people were taking. So if you were in the north of the city going south or east going west, the, the, the temple, getting in and out of it was a shortcut instead of kind of going around the long way. And so you've got all these people with their gear and their stuff, and they're just trying to get from one side of the city to the other who are going through the temple. Now, in the church today, in the Christian movement, we don't have something equivalent to this. So it would be really hard for us to appreciate just exactly uh, what was going on here. But just for the sake of reference, humor me please. Imagine in the sanctuary where the, the church has gathered to worship. Imagine if uh, you know that sanctuary was basically in a mall. And so you have a room that's devoted to worship. But let's say that it's open air. And so there's people who are walking back and forth at the mall. They're exercising, right? You've got your shoppers, your people on their phone. And it's just really loud. And then not only that, but you've got people who are shouting what they're selling, all those kiosks in the middle of the mall who are you know, telling you need, you need to come here so I can exfoliate your fingernails and all that stuff. Anyway, just imagine how difficult it would be to concentrate with all of that background noise. Well, that's in some small way what's going on here. And so write down these scriptures because this is uh, the place where it mentions these. But in Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 through 17, and the rest, Jesus comes into the temple, and he sees the money changers, he sees the merchants, and he is overcome uh, with emotion, with righteous anger because of what the temple was supposed to be and what they had turned it into. Now, this isn't the first time he's done this, and that's kind of the wild thing for me. Is like You would think if you were a money changer uh, or a merchant, if you saw Jesus coming in, you would start scooping up your supplies back. Get out of here, that crazy guy is back. Because in the, in the book of John, I believe chapter 2, uh, he goes in and does the same thing. And he is trying to get the people to see that that which is holy should not be made common. And that which is common should not be made holy. That's one of our takeaways. That's an old point that I learned from 
Brother Bill Davis a long time ago. Uh, he talked about the dangers of taking that which is holy and making it common and taking that which is common and making it holy. Now, in regard to making something common, holy, it would be like a relic or uh, some sort of jewelry or, or anything really that's, that has no value. It's made out of rock or wood or gold or whatever precious metal. And you embody that item with the holiness that God uh, would have reserved for himself and, and through a spiritual relationship with him. Likewise, there's the danger of taking that which is holy and making it common. That the, what we offer to God in worship, uh, when we come together in one place, whenever we are communing with the body and the blood of Jesus, when we break from the bread, when we drink from the cup, you know, th those are obviously common elements, a cup of grape juice, a uh, loaf of unleavened bread. However, there's a holy aspect to them, and this is what Jesus asked us to do. This is what the Bible has asked us to do. So in that regard, we have to have the mindset of not turning that which is holy into something common. And that's what they've done. They had this holy place where this is where they were supposed to come and offer their sacrifices for sin, and yet they had turned it into a common market. So there's a great takeaway for us and the dangers of it today. Here's one more, or two more rather. Um, it is possible, this is a warning for you and me, it's possible to shut the kingdom on others. When we get so caught up in the busyness of religion, where we are more interested in self-righteousness than on heaven's righteousness, that we can shut the kingdom up, that people would see our self-righteousness be turned off by our hypocrisy and not want anything to do with Christianity. You want to know one of my, my least favorite phrases? I hate the phrase, it's not about religion, it's about relationship, because it's so misguided. I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to get people who have been turned off by religion and maybe some of the things that are self-righteous, and they're saying it's just about a relationship with Jesus. The, the problem is that what we learned last week in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made it pretty clear that we have to, to pursue the kingdom. We have to be righteous. God's righteous. We have to be filled with his light. We have to be living the life. And the whole being in a relationship but not religious movement tries to erode everything away except for what you believe about Jesus. Now, the blood of Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith. However, Jesus has called us to holy living. So anyway, that's my soapbox moment for the day. But just be careful. It is possible to shut the kingdom on others with self-righteousness. But pursue God's righteousness and do it the right way. Okay, and that's maybe the, the intro to the, the final point, and then I'll be done. And that is... It is important to do what is right. Could you imagine? Could you imagine the scene where Jesus is going around and he's tied this, got this cord and he is just whipping at people and moving them out of there? All these people that had clogged in, you know, they're trying to get to the other side. And Jesus, here comes this crazy guy whipping and he's just throwing over tables. There's coins going everywhere and people are clamoring after coins and, and there's maybe sheep that are uh, baying and there's doves that are, that are starting to fly all over the place because he's just tearing everything up. First, it's really hard for me to imagine that people are just casually letting that happen. You know, they're just kind of watching. Well, there he goes again. But regardless of maybe what their reaction is, the point is, is Jesus did what was right, even though it was going to be... Uh, awkward or it might be uh, upsetting or people might not like what he was doing or you know it would be bad for his ministry or whatever Jesus did what was right he did the right thing it was a house of prayer that had been turned into a den of thieves and my I guess admonition to you as we leave this scene you know it, we've gone through Sunday and we've gone through Monday and Jesus, after he does this and he goes back out and they see the fig tree is cursed, 
The takeaway for me is that I've got to do the right thing. And that right thing is going to be obeying God, regardless of what everybody else is doing. So if your friends or your family, God forbid, or your neighbors or your community is, is hating on what God has said to do, then a takeaway from Jesus is that even when everybody was doing what they thought was right, Jesus did what he knew was right. And I hope you'll take that and use it today. Okay, so that's the end of Sunday and Monday, right? And tomorrow is Tuesday, both in our calendar and also in the study. We'll talk about Tuesday, a day of preaching where Jesus deals with a bunch of arguments and he also delivers some very powerful sermons. So uh, with that in mind, I will go ahead and uh, end the study. I will have prayer and then uh, we'll go ahead and be done. Maybe a couple of announcements before I finish. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to do prayer and then I'll do the announcements. So uh, if you have any prayer requests, you can send me a private message. I'd be happy to pray about that. And uh, so anyway, here we go. Humble yourself. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this opportunity to study your word. And we pray that you would please uh, help us to do our best to consider Jesus' final week. Help us to look at the scriptures, to take the scriptures for what they say and as they're revealed to us. We pray that you would bless us to be honest with them and to be honest with the takeaways that we can get. We're so thankful for Jesus that he would be willing to sacrifice himself for our sins. And I pray we pray that this study um, across the week would be helpful for those who are Christians and that they would be uh, encouraged. We pray for those who are listening who are not Christians that they would see the gospel in through these words and not through me, but through the message and that through the message that they would be convinced that Jesus is the Christ and that they need to obey the gospel. Father, it's our prayer that you would please bless the nurses and the doctors, that you would bless our government officials and all those who are working so diligently to protect us from the coronavirus. And we pray for those who are sick. We pray uh, for those who've lost loved ones. Father, specifically today we're thinking about the Eastman family and we pray that you'd please bless them with the passing of Brother Art and that uh, he would be enjoying his reward. We are thankful for that and we rejoice that he is at rest. But please bless his family as they mourn his loss and they cope with these times ahead. Father, we love you. We love your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, well, that's it for today. And the final thing I'll just say is this. Tomorrow is Tuesday, and I'll have the study at 11 o'clock. But for anybody who's interested, and specifically I'm thinking of a younger audience, uh, if you'd like to come in an hour before at 10 o'clock a.m., I'm doing a Bible study called Bible Basics, and we're drawing a Bible timeline where kids and the young at heart, however old you might be, it's my goal to help you be able to explain the big picture of the Bible from start to finish. And then, uh, so I'll be doing that one at 10 o'clock, and it's only on Tuesday, no other days. This study at 11 is every day, Monday through Friday. And then on Thursday, unrelated to the religious content, I offer a, a virtual field trip or a virtual science lesson, and it's only for the month of April. So we've had two already, and there's two more but it's on honeybees. I keep honeybees. I'm a hobby beekeeper. And so I've got two more lessons with that. And if you'd like to come to a live study on that or live uh, lesson on that, please do. So have a wonderful day. Great to see you. And Lord willing, 